You are listening to Beyond the Verse, a Star Citizen podcast. A show dedicated to Cloud Imperium Games, Star Citizen, and Squadron 42. Whether you fight, explore, unite, and or trade, we bring you news, updates, interviews, reviews, and analysis. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a pour of Radagast, and join us as we go Beyond the Verse. Launch sequence activated. Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 64 of Beyond the Verse Star Citizen Podcast. I'm your host, Solus. And on today's episode, we will be covering uh, patch 324 in the Evocati, or we'll give the latest updates on that patch and where it's at. We'll get into the roadmap roundup, which basically publishes or commits to all the features that are happening with 324. We will then get into Inside Star Citizen, which is the locations team, um, specifically the level design. And then we will end with going through a few articles of the Galactopedia, uh, mainly For me, the biggest takeaway from the Galactopedia is Squadron 42 now has an article. And I don't know about you, but I've tried to do research on what the story is for Squadron 42, and we know very little about what we can expect, uh, hopefully next year when the game is launched. But first, (laughs) a word from our sponsors and then we'll get started. Welcome back. So I hope this finds everybody well. Since last episode, this was last Friday, um, I ended up going down south, very, very, very deep south Texas, um, just north of Falfurious, if that's a location that is familiar to you as a listener. Uh, But we went to ranch country, took my wife and took my two kids. Uh, They got to fish for the first time. And so, and then there's a reason why I'm going into this, (laughs) I I promise. Uh, But we took them out to the lake. Um, They were able to fish on on the side. Uh, We didn't have a boat or anything to get out there, but my son and daughter both caught their very first fish. It was a very exciting, Very exciting time. I'm actually really glad my younger daughter also caught a fish. They have this rivalry already (laughs) at this age, eight and five. Um, So it was really cool to have them both catch a fish. And then we did end up keeping uh, a few and taught them the, you know, the fundamentals of hunting. And, you know, we, we eat everything that we catch and, you know, we dispose of all the rest of the pieces back into nature. So it, it goes back to that circle of life, all the, all the hunting principles, right. That, that the South, um, holds so dear. So it was a very awesome time. I've been kind of detached. This is the why. This is why I'm telling you. Uh, I've been kind of detached over the weekend, and then this week was a crazy, crazy week um, at work. So, a lot of what we'll be covering today. Um, I spent a couple hours deep diving. It's not like it's the first time I'm looking at each one of these subjects, but there wasn't a lot that went down this week. Um, Patch 324 and Evocati has been kind of kicked back and forth. It got pushed several times. We had one live Evocati test a couple of days ago. It was not a good experience is what I'm reading. I'm not Evocati. And then they put out a a, a newest build or the latest build that came out Thursday. And so that's still live in the PTU for Evocati, not the rest of us (laughs) Um, but there's there's just i mean that's it that's basically it for this week so it might be a fast podcast but one that i think um i'll do my best to to keep you all engaged Uh, and as always we will start with from the community so let's go incoming message all right to the spotify polls and q a for episode 63 that i called end of h1 in star citizen never really actually went into it <laughs> didn't actually speak uh about the end of h1 so um h1 h2 is not a common 
terminology for most people in in in, in the working world or i guess in corporate world um, we say h1 h2 for the first half of the year second half of the year and this is the end of h1 actually today um, is the end of h1 with it being june 28th so the first half of the year is gone um, I'm curious what everybody thinks of H1. Like, are we happy with the release of a cosmetic patch of 323? Um, are we happy? Or are we satisfied with that being essentially it? Uh, do we feel like that that's enough, right? Um, or do we wish there was more? I think that's a valid question. I think we thought there would be more, um, but I'm, I'm personally happy with getting Squadron 42 aesthetics into Star Citizen. So the end of H1, I was going to summarize that last episode. We hit an hour and a half worth of news, so I didn't really get into it. Uh, but I did ask the question for episode 63, have you been able to successfully complete Xenothread and earn your Orc Mark X armor set? And so we had several votes. We had 20 votes. Um, so good engagement. Again, appreciate you responding and being part of the conversation. Let's go through the numbers, right? We had... 30% say yes, and 30% say never tried. I would love to ask those six individuals that said that they never tried it, the, the why. I don't blame them. I'm not saying that they're wrong for not even trying, but I, I'm curious if it's just if Xenothreat's not their thing, if they're just more into the PvP aspect rather than the pve um I, i'd be curious <clears throat> excuse me i'd be curious as to why they just never tried but i thought that was interesting so 30 percent say yes uh and then we have 25 percent say no but they're still trying um that's i don't know it's hard like we took an entire org we took sole provision um into xenothread and barely got through phase two so this this is a uh, a very difficult global event. So the no but still trying resonates with me, resonates with a lot uh, of the community that I interact with. And then we had 15% say no and stopped trying. So these are the individuals that probably attempted phase two or they just attempted phase three and got burnt out because it is so layered. And when I say layered, it's it's pretty straightforward. There's only like three things you need to do, but it's just constant bombarding of the enemy. And so, you know, you're almost there. You're almost getting all the items and you're, you're trying to get it to the, the INS Jericho and you're just getting destroyed by AI, which brings in master modes and all the other debates. But <laughs> uh, this this bucket, this 15 percent are those that probably got burnt out and said, nah, not worth the Orc Mark X armor. So. And it is kind of interesting. Um, I talked to Space Tomato a little bit on on Discord about this, um, but getting Xeno Threat armor, um, I, I'm curious if people are are like fundamentally like morally against <laughs> wearing Xeno Threat. Right? It's like the Xeno Threat gang. They're I mean they're a horrible entity. They um, believe in the extermination of you know races and species like they're 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 pretty rough um to say the least <laughs> so would you wear this gear i mean i don't know um it looks cool i think i think the like the actual aesthetics or the uh, additional pieces of the orc mark x like it's modified it's got additional things on the shoulders beyond just the logo xeno thread on the chest so i think they did a really good job w with this armor um, i don't know if i want to plaster something so controversial on my chest unless i'm role playing something so i don't know very good conversation i appreciate your response to the polls played out basically how i expected other than the 30 percent saying that they've just never tried um, super interesting. All right, so let's go to the Q and A. And I realized I didn't share my screen for the poll, so let me share my screen here uh, for the Q and A. But we had ten responses. Uh, so again, thank you for the engagement. This is our second most engaged uh, Q and A. So I'm going to go through this pretty fast already. So here we go. Uh, this first one was Groza. Groza, you did it, man. You are number one, first on the list. Uh, responds back with. 
I don't, oh, I should ask you the question. <laughs> so I asked the question, what are your reactions to changing the name from patch 323.2 to patch 324? A little bit of drama. I, I mean, very, very little bit of drama. But like we discussed what, two weeks ago, um, there was an announcement that came out that said that CIG felt there were so many new items. It was such a big patch it deserved. It's like hold number um, nomenclature. So 323 is 323.2 becomes 324. So what are your reactions? Grizzle was first. Let's go. Quote, I don't understand what the impact significance is of all of this. Uh, you numbers people might as well be speaking Xi'an. Do your thing, CIG. Um, okay, my response to Groza, it, it, it doesn't matter. And I think that's the point, right? The majority of people were like, okay, cool. It's It doesn't. It doesn't change anything. The sky is blue. Blue is the color of the sky. Those sentences are interchangeable, right? You see 323.2, 324 doesn't change the material that is coming out in the patch. So actually the sentiment of your question, I think is the majority of the response. The little bit of drama that comes in is the other side of that coin is they were accusing CIG of having an excuse to be able to push this back. Well, it was so big. 324 is such a, a, a monumental, you know, patch number compared to 323. Um, it just it, it adds weight to them being able to push it back and have like a reason to kick the can down the street, um, even though we have no intel to support that no no there's nowhere in any official star citizen documentation that suggests this is being kicked down the uh, you know the street or 4.0 is not still scheduled for Q4 or Q3 Freudian slip <laughs> uh, so so far pyro is still on track for Q3 all right, Dakota Riley, quote, I'm going to miss the 323.2 name, but it is completely justified to be renamed to a full patch. Uh, the cargo changes are so massive, it just makes more sense than the 323.2 patch name warranted. Yes, full agreement there. The cargo changes, um, I'm, I'm very sure you mean like the, the cargo hangers or the freight elevators. I, I'm I'm shocked, and we'll talk about this in another segment. I, I'm shocked that cargo hauling, like the new mission type, is not part of the Evocati testing. That does kind of surprise me a little bit. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it is. No, I'm gonna save that for the next segment. Okay. <laughs> Back, back to call me teach quote, whatever they need to do to get it finished is fine by me. I'm ready for this game to be more playable. Yes, right there with you. Organite last night, um, we actually had a really smooth night. So I think if you're doing your own thing, um, you're not really doing an official loop, <laughs> which is what we were, what we were doing. Um, it actually plays it actually plays really well we got some good content we're actually in the process of trying to make a, a soul provision commercial it's going to air on this podcast on our youtube channel uh, and all across all socials but kind of a fun light-hearted commercial for joining soul provision and what we do in between major events like xeno threat and so we have a a, a game loop that we've created where uh, not to like spoil anything, but we've got like a three uh, three pronged approach to our soul provision mission, our soul provision game loop, where we have a hunter team that goes and kills bounties, and then behind them comes a gatherer team. So that was actually part of the gatherer team last night, where we take like a C two and we follow up behind and go and take off all of the cargo that is on the downed ship we move it on to the c2 fill it up and then we have a third team like the salvaging crew the cleanup crew uh, that comes in with vultures i think we had a reclaimer last night or maybe we should have had a reclaimer last night but we come in and salvage the rest and so we have the bounty making us money we've got the um the collectors or the gatherers that are going to be selling. I have to sell all the inventory today uh, to make money. Then of course we have the salvaging that's going to be making us money as well. Very profitable, very fun, touches most of the game loops that we have uh, in Star Citizen. So that was smooth, had no issues with the game, no 30Ks, no, um, no issues at all. So hopefully some of this is being fixed for you, Call Me Teach. All right, Anna. I haven't seen any changes. What should I look out for? The game has been good to me so far with one crash. 
what time at the Meridian line is org night. And then she actually goes by prime entity. Uh, <laughs> quote, we haven't talked on socials. Um, yeah, I think a couple weeks ago I had recognized the name and said that we had uh, conversed or we had gone back and forth on socials. I think it was more that I recognized the name regardless let's work backwards what time at meridian line is org night so don't make me do math live real time so we are uh, u.s central so that's utc minus five i can do this i can do this so it's thursday night 9 p.m u.s central so 9 p.m 10 11 12 1 2 that's 2 a.m it's 2 a.m uh, UTC or 2 a.m. Um, Meridian time uh, or GMT. <clears throat> okay, so the game has been good to me so far with one crash. Fantastic. I'm really happy to hear that. Curious what the game loops you are playing because um, I think delivery is still pretty jacked. I think that one's kind of glitchy. Uh, but then I haven't seen any changes. What should I look out for? Um, there, there hasn't been any changes. The only thing about 324, I guess that has changed, but it's old news, I think, is the, um, the unique item recovery is pushed. That's it. So we're still getting the, um, the item banks, which I think has, it has another name. Um, and I'm trying, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but we are, uh, we're getting the item banks, the freight elevators. We'll go through the list here in a couple of seconds. Um, let me just do it now. Uh, we get personal instance hangers, freight elevators, storage access. There you go. Those are the uh, the item banks. Hover trolleys, hangar decorations, and then I'm going to say tentatively because it's not ready for testing. Uh, cargo hauling missions, the cargo commodity rebalance, and then the dynamic event blockade runner. So what's not on that list is is the um, the unique item recovery that's been pushed. That's it. All right, Dreamer of Days, quote, found the change insignificant. We'll get what we get when we get it. <laughs> I'd rather CIG take the time to do it right. Also, we did finish the event, but I didn't get the armor. Well, that sucks. Dreamer of Days, I'm sure you know this, but make sure you take a screenshot of you, um, the mission's complete that says that you have completed that mission. There's also a code. Um, it's on... It's on... Um, spectrum and it's on star citizen socials but there's a code that you can throw into the command prompt in game that'll show you like the um the status of your completed missions but take a screenshot showing that you are complete and then send in a ticket um and you'll get your armor too easy wandering marauder Quote, I'm not fully educated on patch naming conventions, but I read it as a reflection of the scope of the patch, i.e. it's a pretty significant update. I could be wrong, but isn't it just semantics? Yes and no. So in the gaming world, or I guess any production, any production at all, you usually have three numbers that matter, right? So the three, the dot two, three, and the dot zero, like the three dot 24 dot zero or 4.0.0. Right. So think of it like um, think of like a book, like book number one, like of a series. Pick your favorite series of books. Book number one is that first number. So like we're in we're in patch three dot. Let's just say three dot twenty four. So we're in book three. So it's its own story. It, 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 it is its own world beginning, middle end complexities, drama, all that, right? So you're in book three. You're in book three at this current moment. Let's say you're in chapter 24. So in chapter 24, again, a lot can happen. when We move the storyline. They're usually robust. Um, significant moments within the book, right? You reference chapters. In chapter five of book three, you know, this major all uh, life-altering event happens, right? And then you can see that third decimal point as like a section within the chapter, a paragraph, right? Or yeah, I guess, I guess a paragraph would be a good, uh, a good example. So it's, you know, you change your paragraphs, that's 0 .0, 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Um, what they're saying in this example is CIG is saying this is worth its own chapter. It's not worth its own book. Pyro is its own book, but 24 is 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 significant it should be its own chapter within book three so there you, i hope 
I don't I hope that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Admiral Zeke, quote, all in all, I did not it did not catch me off guard. I like to think of 323 as UI updates, now 324 is gameplay updates. I hope it doesn't push back 4.0. Okay, number one, you clearly listen to this podcast. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I appreciate your patronage. That is 100% um, how I feel. 323 was the cosmetics, right? It was it was the copy and paste of Squadron 42 into Star Citizen. A lot of people will say, oh, you know, it's super easy. It was it wasn't uh, as big of a deal, you know, as uh, as other people are thinking or should be. Um, but it did. It overhauled a lot of how Star Citizen plays and looks. Right. So 323 cosmetics and 324 is the gameplay that was supposed to kind of come with it. Right. Um, so I'm 100 percent in agreement there. The part where you say, I hope it doesn't push back 4.0, they really don't um, correlate. There's there's not like any tech advances in 324. So 324, yeah, personal hangers, instance hangers, it's all awesome. Cargo hauling, it's, it's all awesome. But there isn't like true groundbreaking tech that is required for 4.0. They should not really correlate so don't think of like they can push 324 out into q3 and still release 4.0 in q3 one does not affect the other sasquatch rumble quote patch number doesn't matter i'm just glad to see cig locking in and progress spring being made absolutely this next person uh, if you're watching on youtube i don't know how to read that username it's literally like keyboard smashing don't know who this is, uh, but quote, it's a name change. Nothing too significant to me. As long as development continues, I'm fine with it. And then Kerma, quote, if the additions are big enough to consider it a complete jump to a new mini version instead of just a small patch, then sure. So I think all of the sentiment jives. I think we're all on the same page. It's, it's not a big deal. The name convention was not a big deal, but I think when we have even the slightest bit of drama in the community, I love going to you and getting your opinion. So that's the why that was our Q&A from last episode. We did not have any drama this week. Knock on wood. Uh, we did not have any drama this week. So I'll be thinking of another question to ask y'all. Honestly, it might be selfish. In fact, it probably will be selfish. It'll probably be more about the podcast itself and not necessarily Star Citizen content as we're trying, we're in episode 64. I'm trying to uh, like pivot and mold this into something that's more uh, engaging for you. So I have some questions I wanna ask you um, to gauge which direction we take the podcast. So stand by for that. Okay, I did ask one poll on social media um, and it, it, it got fairly decent uh, engagement. We had over two, almost 2,000 views and just under 600 votes. And so I actually asked the same question that was just discussed in our q and I asked in this post, but with the current barriers facing 324 for Evocati, do you believe that 4.0 will be impacted for the expected Q3 launch. Again, we just discussed that they should not correlate. They're, one should not affect the other. But again, I wanted to ask you. So here's the breakdown. And you can see they are very close. Your options were on, on track for Q3. We'll delay to Q4. We'll delay to Q1 of 2025. And then we'll delay beyond Q1 of 2025, which hopefully that's not the case. So here's how the responses ended up. 34.3% say that it's going to delay until Q4. 25.1% say it's going to delay to Q1 of 2025. And then sadly, 23.5% feel that it's going to delay beyond Q1. And then only 17.1% felt that it was still on track for Q3. So that was asked what day? 24th. So that was asked on June 24th. That was four days ago. Since then, we had the roadmap roundup, which we'll talk about in a segment here in a couple of seconds. Um, it's, it's still on track for Q3. 
Again, no indicators, nothing in SC test chat or in Spectrum, none of the notes, nothing from official Star Citizen channels suggests that it's not going to still release in Q3. Now it'll be, it'll be probably the last day of Q3, right? Um, I can see it being like September, like 30th, right? I, I'm. It could very well be the last day. Um, it's got to be before CitizenCon. And I think I've said this before, but it, it it is going to look so bad for CIG if they don't get it out before CitizenCon. Pyro was the entire theme of last year's CitizenCon. And if we're no closer to it this CitizenCon than what we were last year, it's not going to bode well. So they absolutely need to get this pushed out. Um, and I still think Squadron 42 becomes the theme of this Citizen Con with an announce, a play test, all that fun stuff for Squadron 42. And then Squadron 42 releases next year. So there you go. And I don't think I shared my screen on that either. <laughs> I got to get better at, uh, at sharing my screen. So, but there you go. Let's get into this week in Star Citizen to the article. I will now share my screen for those of you on YouTube. Let's go. Quote, <clears throat> last week inside Star Citizen returned from a hiatus with guns toting, providing a load of firearm sneak peeks while introducing the weapon content team. Weapons of all kinds are also required to fight off the ongoing Xeno threat invasion, which runs until June 25th. It's done. That was three days ago. So Xeno threat's done. It allows you to earn a set of Xeno threat medium armor. Jump into the game, accept the Overdrive Initiative priority mission, and defend the people of Stan. We also want to say thank you for all the detailed feedback you've provided throughout the event. Our team is monitoring issues closely as they arise. Meanwhile, the team is focused on preparing Star Citizen Alpha 324 for its upcoming release. We'll share more information soon as we gear up to deploy to the PTU servers for testing. That's specifically the Evocati PTU. All right, now let's see what's going on this week. Straight down to the bullet points. Tuesday, Lore Post Galactopedia will end today's episodes going over some of those articles. Wednesday, we have the roadmap update and roundup. Thursday, Inside Star Citizen. And then today, after this podcast, we will get the RSI Weekly Newsletter. We will get the Star Citizen Live. And we'll get the Jump Point Magazine for June 2024. And while I have you, let's just look and see if that Jump Point is live. We'll do this, uh, we'll do this real time. So account, subscribers jump point what do we got here jump point issue no it's still april 2024 so at the time of recording this 806 a.m u.s central no there is no jump point all right cool so the first thing i wanted to take us through is what is happening right now in evocati so evocati has patch 324 and here here's something very interesting about what's happening um I hope CIG bans the majority of Evocati at this current moment. Like there are videos and they're not supposed to, right? It's like here, here's this quote. The current build is under NDA, talking about the features and testing is allowed, but no sharing of game video, screenshots, audio files, or accounts outside of Evocati, right? This little quote right here. I hope they ban the majority of Evocati. I, I am... Here's my own, I guess my own drama. I am very disappointed. The moment they threw Evocati to the popular content creators, this is what happens, right? This is what happens. So we, we're getting videos of the hangers, uh, the personal hangers bringing up ships and it's all it's all great. Like we're, we're seeing the lights, we're seeing all the directional lights, it's, it's good. But then we also saw the um, hover trolleys right? Like a couple days ago, we saw hover trolleys. These are things we're not supposed to be seeing. Now I will rebut and correct myself. If these are videos taken from previous like inside star citizens or from other like CIG channels, by all means have at it, I would be wrong and I would correct myself in the next episode. But right now it looks like we have some jackasses that call themselves Evocati and they do this for likes and attention. They want to get the first videos out there and they want to make their content and they want to move on. Uh, shame on them. 
it's I'm very disappointed in what we call evocati or this pre 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 alpha testers. So there's my little drama soapbox I want to jump on. But let's get into the actual patch notes themselves. So available for Evocati right now. It is actually live currently as we record. Um, let's get into it. Note, this patch does not contain all of the intended features, which will be added iteratively to the notes as they become available. Additionally, some features may be implemented in a partial state and as such are not ready for testing. When those features reach a playable state, they'll be detailed on those notes and added to the quote testing focus. Please issue counsel all issues related to those in testing focus and in general gameplay. So here's what is being tested. Personal instance hangers, freight elevators, storage access, formerly known as item banks, hover trolleys, and the fifth hanger decorations all awesome we've had personal instance hangers ruined i've seen the hover trolleys ruined i haven't seen the freight elevators haven't seen the storage access seen a couple of like overlays in official cig channels uh, that was actually in an inside star citizen um so whatever i guess you can call that ruined but the hanger decorations i am super excited for i am very excited to see where this goes first off decorating it making it home like that's gonna be awesome but it sounds like there's like a full out you know marketing um like a shop experience to go and buy things for your hanger that's great i want to see crafting i want to be able to craft my own hanger decorations i think that would be awesome i want to put crafting stations inside of my hanger basically i want the elder scrolls online housing system inside star citizen <laughs> basically i want to do it all in my hanger um so i think that's really really awesome can't wait for that to happen my whole gaming experience is going to change when this comes out. I'll, we'll probably spend many hours in the game just sitting in my hanker, decorating it, moving it around. So let's talk about the videos that have ruined um, or that have inappropriately uh, went into showcasing what, what this is. The personal instance hangers, it, it looks great, y'all. It looks great. Um, once you call up the ship, the lights change, they flicker. You've got lights that will shine down on the ship as it rises. You can actually look over the edge and see the ship rising. These are videos that have been in Inside Star Citizen whenever they first kind of previewed, uh, but this was the first, like, we saw it actually happen inside of Evocati. So that's a, a really awesome experience. I would love to see how it interacts with ASOP terminals, what that ASOP terminal inside your hangar looks like and feels like when you're calling up ships. Um, the freight elevators, how that interacts, like you're going to basically have a server room inside of your hangar to call up all these different things. Um, so I'm just, I, I want to see how it's all laid out and how it executes, right? Let's go into the not ready for testing. The cargo hauling missions, the cargo commodity rebalance, and then I, I think this is this is okay, but the dynamic event blockade runner is also not ready for testing, and that's fine. Usually dynamic events can be postponed. Like, they will happen because they're dynamic. They're not always on. Um, so that, I don't care. I don't really mind that that's not being tested. But the cargo hauling is either it's not being tested because either one of two things. One, it's done. It's it's a mission. It's a mission set, just like any other mission set, that just so happens to to carry, you know, massive amounts of cargo from point A to point B. So maybe it doesn't need testing, like personal hangers and stuff does. Maybe, or or they wanted to focus more on these other things to receive feedback. So usually in PTUs, it is a focused test. They want they want feedback on like one or two items. They don't wanna push every item because you, you get more of a peanut butter spread of feedback as opposed to a very deliberate surgical feedback. So it could be that they just have more work to do on hangers, elevators, storage access, trolleys, decorations, right? And so I think either one of those scenarios makes this okay. I just don't want to see cargo hauling being pushed. That is what Soul Provision is most excited about. That's what I am most excited about. I want to be a space trucker with my, I don't know, Caterpillar or my C2. Um, 
my whole C, right? Like I, I want to space truck for hours. That's my thing. Um, okay, so the rest of this known issues, we never really go through those, whatever, it just, just says what they're currently looking at, what they're currently testing. Um, features and gameplay. So right now this patch is added carry, added carry lowered FPS weapon keybind, which is Alt R. Okay, I don't necessarily, I've never carried my weapon lowered, so I don't necessarily know what the point, and I would love to hear someone's feedback on like how often do you carry your weapon lowered. I either have it holstered or I have it drawn. Um, updated inventory container icons, cool. Some UI updates, that's good. Ships and vehicles, increased overall spread values for vehicle cannons and reduced vehicle laser damage by 10%. Core tech, Vulcan performance, reuse the GPU buffer instead of recreating them to improve performance and memory fragmentation. Awesome, Vulcan needs a lot of work. Um, I've had pretty good success running Vulcan um, while playing, but it definitely needs some optimization. The whole game needs optimization, obviously, but um, Vulcan probably needs the most love. So there you go. And while I have you here and we're already talking about commitments to, um, to 324, let's just go into the roadmap roundup. All right, super easy. This was just commitments and just for 324. Nothing about 4.0 and that's okay, we're fine with that. But let's get into the committed. This is again, all we have is the committed for Alpha 324. So we've got storage access, freight elevators, new missions, cargo hauling, here you go. So here in the latest, this was Wednesday. So Wednesday they are saying that cargo hauling is committed for Alpha 324, regardless of it not being tested in Evocati. Cool. Personal Instance Hangers Dynamic Event Blockade Runner. So no surprises there. We know that the unique items has been pushed out. No surprises to the roadmap roundup. What I do wanna do is take a couple of seconds and take us into the progress tracker. We go to release view, and for the first time, I'm pretty, I'm like 99% sure. <laughs> For the first time, we actually have 4.0 as a tentative in the release view. Again, the first time I'm seeing it doesn't mean I'm wrong or I'm right. But 324, this is what we just covered, right? So these are all the commitment cards that are happening and that are going to release for 324. But what I find interesting is 4.0 is on here as well. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at, uh, ooh, I didn't realize I could minimize those. Nice. Let's take a look at 4.0 and what we can expect. We've got one character entry, 15 location entries, which is basically all the pyro locations. We don't need to go into that. We have one AI entry, four gameplay entries, two ship and vehicle entries, three weapon and items entries, and three core tech entries. Let's go. Characters. So the one entry we have is additional player customization, that is hair and face customizations. I like stumbled through that word, but we got there. <laughs> so hair and face customizations uh, for the additional player customization, boom. All right, so the locations, like I said, these are all the pyro locations. We don't need to go through every single one of these. The AI is the quasi grazer, also known as the space cow. So in 4.0, we're beginning, we'll be getting the space cow. Uh, that was first debuted in Citizen Con's video, um, the Future of Gaming video. Gameplay, there's four entries. We've got Fire Hazard, we've got Engineering, we've got Life Support, very cool. And we got the Solar Burst. Solar Burst, obviously, in Pyro, will get those flares that happen that affect your user interface, affect your HUD, your MFD, uh, etc. So, very cool. Very cool for gameplay. Uh, the two ships and vehicles, we have the RSI Zeus Mark II ES. So it looks like we're gonna be getting the ES first, um, but that's coming out with 4.0. So usually that means that the two like alternate vehicles are coming right behind it, right? We're gonna be getting the second and the third version of the Mark II or the Zeus Mark II very shortly after. So that's exciting. Weapons and items. We have multi-tool updates. Very cool, let's actually read it. Adding additional functionality to the multi-tool, including cutting and consumption of batteries for operation. Very cool. So we'll have a more realistic multi-tool, that's the gray cat multi-tool. Charge drain, 
adding functionality to the multi-tool to allow draining and charging power to objects. That's exciting. Uh, fire, that's probably more for like resource management. I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to remember what it was said about charging items. I know your battery will be consumed, so you won't have this infinite use of your multi-tool. But what else would you be charging if not for resource management? I don't know. Good questions. <laughs> uh, fire extinguisher. So implementing functional fire extinguisher in game. And then we've got core tech. And this one's obvious. I think we're all tracking this. But the transit system refactor, the mission system refactor, and then the server meshing. Version 1 of server meshing. Pretty sure it's the static server meshing. And then version 2 is the dynamic server meshing. So, which is no surprise. We knew that that was coming in 4.0. And there you have it. Remember my analogy about books. There's your pyro book, an entirely new system, right? I cannot wait to get into 4.0. Whether it's Q3 or Q4 this year, it is this year. I, I can almost put my word on this year. Again, I, it has to be before Citizen Kind. Has to. Okay, we've got Inside Star Citizen, and then we have the Galactopedia update to round out this podcast. So let's get into let's get into Inside Star Citizen. Sharing my screen um, straight from the article. Quote: How does a sandbox game like Star Citizen approach level design? Join us today to explore how the Frankfurt level design team combines gameplay elements and environments to create cohesive game experiences. Without further ado. Let's go. Inside Star Citizen is many different things to many different people. But at the center of it all is our desire to educate about the very nature of game development itself. And in this week's part two of our three-part experimentation and format, we lean into that aspect and explore some of the foundational philosophies that guide just one of the teams that are continuously working to iterate and improve on the persistent universe as it prepares to grow in this year's upcoming Alpha 4.0. Now, where last week we met the team, this week it's how we work level design with the folks from the Frankfurt level design team. Well, level design. It's probably one of the hardest things to describe in game development. We take gameplay elements and we take the environment and we just bring all that together. It is more than the sum of all of its pieces. You can't just kind of speed level design a forest log cabin. That's not enough. Like, what is the player doing there? What does it mean? Why does this thing exist in this space? What can the player do as well? You've got the environment art that makes the art itself. This is not us. We have the gameplay teams that make all the gameplay elements, and this is not us. What we do is we take these two things, we combine them together and make it cohesive environment for you guys. We design the space itself, and we also accommodate that everything that goes inside of it. A lot of the things that you use, like hangers, ATC, I hate to say it, transit systems. Elevator rides. Wait, you're responsible for the elevators? Elevators are our problem, yeah. <laughs> no, we're just just a setup site. <laughs> if you die in the elevator, that's actually a problem from the coding side. We just <laughs> throwing them under the bus. <laughs> Is it possible in a sense? I, I, I will say this though, I haven't had, I haven't died in an elevator in a very long time. During Invictus launch week, a few of us glitched through the elevator and we were like in the middle of Microtech planet. Um, but I haven't like just died on, uh, on an elevator in a very long time. So I don't know. Have you? <laughs> Sandbox game to have level design? Yes, because you have to consider all of the individual constituent pieces and why they need to exist together. You can throw anything in there, but you have to account for like, does this begin to break the game? So you have conversations with economy, you have conversations with code, you have conversations with system design, mission design, and you have to figure out how all these pieces, again, stitch together. 
So there are six principles for good level design. Uh, first is readability. This basically means clarity in your environment. You're going to make sure within your layouts that everybody can understand where they need to go, what they need to do. All the affordances need to make sense. The typical one could be, I've got a door in front of me. How do you describe a locked door from an unlocked door? For example, you, you're fighting an AI, and they can read easily the elements, the gameplay elements. You need to understand your cover space. You need to find the AI within the space. If the AI is in a black area, you will not see it at all. And this is very important for us. We really focus on this kind of stuff, and we make sure that anything you interact with in, in, within the environment, you can see it as clear as possible. Well, next is flow and leading lines. It's, uh, it's creating a, a good composition uh, of all these things from layout, lighting, some props, a good mix of uh, combat spaces or like combat encounters, and then time for exploration, and then doing a mix between both. We make sure that you're not going always on a straight line. We make sure that you're not spending two hours walking from one space to the other. In Pyro, you'll come across a lot more players as we funnel them into a certain space. With, with the concentration of missions, for example, or things to do, you know, that is flow to us. On the flow level, that is higher on the chart. And then certain areas will be a bit more on the lower end of your, of your pacing. They are showing a lot of pyro, which excites the crap out of me. Almost every footage, the B-roll footage that they're showing in the background, it's all pyro. I wonder what that means. Leading lines is a compositional technique. Some examples can be you are following the cables from one interactable through to another arrow to interact with another element. You're being breadcrumbed along, you're being led along these leading lines. With the pyro station, you have the core element, you have the arms pointing towards the center. It's a very simple example, but more on a larger scale. But we look at it also in, in, on a room basis. We're trying to direct you through to a discoverable place over here or trying to direct you to, through to like events. We're using light and cables to navigate you through these spaces. Third is options. We want to give you guys multiple options so you can complete your objective the way you want it. In context of our game is giving the player the opportunity to approach certain situations in different ways or get an idea of the situation in the first place. You have straightforward options, the combat route. You have a more sneaky option for players that don't like to engage in combat so much. Or you can also have like a puzzle route for players that like to do more interesting in, uh, environment interactions. So this is the team responsible for the prison escape. Thank you. And I'm not being facetious or funny or cute. Thank you for creating something so interesting as the prison break game loop. If you haven't done it already, escape from prison the next time you go. Look at a YouTube video, figure it out, but it is a very intricate process to get out of prison. So all of those peeking through windows to get gate codes First off, you have to peek through uh, the first one. You have to peek through to get the gate code for the fan to disable the fan so you can walk through it like you see on the screen in front of you. And then at the very end of the prison break, you peek through a window to get the gate codes that allow you to get a vehicle to drive off once you're, once you're physically outside of prison. Do the prison break. You're in for a treat. I promise you. Then there is clustering. Clustering is a, also falls into the compositional techniques or more in, in the layout side of things. Clustering means that you start like bringing objects together to create something a bit more natural. You put importance on things by grouping certain things up into clusters. A specific power example would be the outposts where you have a big landing pad in the center and then you have groups of clusters of buildings uh, that are arranged around it and they form like points of interest by themselves. We've not always been successful with clustering, but moving forward into the future, especially with Pyram, we're taking a renewed effort to concentrate and cluster things properly. Finally, there's scale and proportion. Scale is important in how you vary it. If everything is large, for example, nothing is large anymore. We are the one that defines all the metrics for FPS, but also for ships. 
We're talking about ships that have a few meters to some ships that have hundreds of meters. And we need to make... Um, uh, so, right in front of you is the Idris. So, uh, just something to just, just something to look at. <laughs> they have an Idris landed at a like it almost looks like a, a mining um, like a mining facility on a random planet. Looks like kind of like Daymar. I'm assuming this is Daymar. Um, but there is a black and yellow Idris, which looks freaking stunning. Please be around the corner. Please, please come out. I don't know. At Citizen Kind. I want my damn Idris. That looks so sick. So sick. I'm sure that the transition from A to B feels always smooth and natural, right? If you, for example, come from a maintenance corridor or a small little packed little vent and expose yourself to this big room, you know, you'll get a more likely an aha moment. So we still have a very big open spaces, but can condense the gameplay space a bit more. So the players don't have so much options to walk around, but still get like the, the sense and the immersion of like a big open space. The proportion is just also feeds into, into scale. So you can use proportions to be able to scale up like what is kind of the background space, what is the foreground space, and what is the midground space of like what is immediately interesting to you as a player and what is in the background that's not yet relevant to you. So you can land a one outpost on Pyro 2 and you can see yourself in a sort of like habitation outpost village. Down the hill you can see there's a refinery area, but the main feature of this place that you were drawn to initially was this massive mining tower. These become like your immediate foreground, your midground, and your background. But again, you can always come into your ship and go to this massive mining tower. Therefore, this becomes the new foreground. You're always orbiting it, you're transferring around. This becomes your landmark to orientate yourself around all these other spaces nearby. Traditionally, in level design, you start out with a pre-production phase. This is where we ideate, conceptualize, we gather references, we do sketches, we do top-down layouts of, of our brain map, put things together. We then go into white box, which is literally going into the editor, start mocking things up in 3D, making, creating the space, and defining where the gameplay elements are. We have a shop on the right, shop on the left, uh, your uh, elevator transit over here. We work at different scales at this point and we define basically everything in the location, but with very, very basic shapes. And then we hand it over to art, so the focus lies more on art for grey boxing, making things more pretty, with us still having an eye on it to see that the original concept is still intact. And then finally we'll move into final art and the level designers will be able to kind of keep all of these locations, like the intent of the location is kept consistent. It doesn't veer off too much into suddenly it's too big or too small. This is the original design direction that we wanted from beginning through to end. Once a location is released, it's not finished for us because there is always maintenance and additions that we do. When there's a new functionality, a new gameplay coming in, uh, we go in and we add them to all the locations, we retrofit the locations. So whenever there is a bug in the PU, we have to maintain these locations. So we would go into uh, New Babbage and fix uh, AI placements or shops not working anymore. But mostly uh, level design is also about coordinating with every team. So a bit with like lighting, mission team, environment art, audio, narrative, they work more or less in like in their pockets and then we try to keep an eye on like the big picture to bring everything together and look that everything is coherent and cohesive. What is important to us, um, or what we really want you to experience, is is a nicer flow in the stations. I think what we realized with Stanton um, is, you know, you just take a ton of elevators from place to place. We kind of want to optimize that for you, uh, make it a bit more efficient, so you don't spend a lot of time going from A to B. We are trying to bring, for example, the clinic and the habitation right away into the shopping area and trying to make it much more compact. At the same time, we really, really want to offer some good gameplay content within the stations outside of missions that you can go into and discover on your own as you explore. We try to improve pyro stations with all the lessons we've got from Stanton. 
and now for outposts, each location has to have its own identity. Like, does this outpost fulfill the need for a combat space? Does this outpost fulfill the need for like a social space? Does this outpost fulfill the need for like a puzzle space? All these factors come into play and come into consideration when creating a whole new location. We want you to be able to discover little points of interest around the outposts, it's, it's kind of further. If you come across an outpost, there, there will be multiple sub-locations around it. These could be like villages around it, this could be derelict settlements that, you, that are abandoned and you have to go into and can find potentially loot in. And once you've landed your ship, you are no more than a short walk away from the main reason you've arrived at this outpost, which is to trade. We want to encourage the use of ground vehicles to be able to pick up your cargo that you bought from this place, load up your little Drake mule, and drive it over to your ship, load that ship, and then fly out with your goods. We wanted to create a location that felt real. So you had the logistic is there. The AI created roads between the different points of interest within the outpost so that it feels logical for a player to walk in or to traverse. Pyro is always dangerous, so any social space can turn into a combat scenario. So you need to be able to duck into cover at a moment's notice, even when you're doing a um, nice, easy trade and socials. So we have to provide you with opportunities for cover and exciting FPS combat scenarios. There's a lot of things to consider for an open world game that on this scale. You have to account for multiple, you know, situations and have players also be able to deal with all kinds of circumstances. So it is a complex undertaking. It's a challenging one, but this is what we want to account for in Pyro as much as we can. Level design matters or is important because we think of a very broad scale and try to craft and create a great experience for you as the player. Level design ends up being greater than the sum of all of its parts. I get to talk with all these different disciplines at CIG, but also get to kind of like hold the hand of the player and curate that all the way through. We focus on the player experience. We look at all the features that exist and we try to bring them up all together into a cohesive environment that feels really fun for the players. Do you always succeed? No, but it's not always like within our hands, but we always try our best to, within the framework we have, um, to create like the best possible experience for you guys. So we've learned a lot from our time in Stanton and we love hearing all the feedback we get from you as players. We want to take that all on board and begin establishing ourselves forward when we come into Pyro. What we really want to do also is balance out gameplay with the visuals. I mean, in the past, we've seen a lot of focus being spent on the visuals and less so on the content. This needs to switch around and find an even plane. And level design is just one way we're doing this in Pyro. Because level designers really want to make Pyro and stand in the future a great experience uh, for the players from a flow perspective, boring you less, making things more efficient for you as you follow the gameplay loops that you want to follow and offer you gameplay content that you can just discover on your own. So what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that level design is a discipline that brings many other aspects of game development together to form what we always hope is a cohesive and enjoyable experience for the player. That the philosophies and precepts that guide their decisions continue to evolve as they learn important lessons from the development of Stanton and, of course, apply it to Pyro and that Pyro itself continues to inspire an experience that should be markedly different from the one we have today in Stanton. For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. Thanks for letting us share the people and process of game development with you, and we'll see you all here next week. Love it. Okay, I always check and make sure that there's no hidden features or announcements at the end of those because they like surprising us from time to time. So yeah, what a great video. And it was all pyro, um, most of it was pyro and what we can expect from the locations team or the level design team uh, in pyro. Can't wait for it to come out. Um, and I do, like, I do like that they're building upon lessons learned in Stanton. First off, Stanton's not a bad, it's not a bad system. It's, I mean, I actually like taking the trolleys everywhere um, or the transport you know shuttles everywhere it, it it is uh it's probably more realistic than having you know your habs and food and medical clinic all in one area it's it's probably more realistic especially uh, especially 
especially with how large Ruin Station is, I would expect that those would be in their own like halls, like their own leg of Ruin Station. I'd be surprised if they tuck it all into one central condensed location. So, but again, I, I like that they're building upon it. Um, so hopefully you got some value out of watching that as well. And again, celebrating a, uh, a team of development that doesn't usually get the spotlight. So thanks for that. That was a lot of fun. All right, Galactopedia update, here we go. I haven't done that sound bite in a long time, um, but it's my it's my lore, it's my story time sound bite. So here we go, Galactopedia update. This was Tuesday for all you lore nerds out there. Um, we had one full length article, twenty short uh, articles. The full length article is Corin. It's a heavily guarded headquarters of the UEE Marines, and then for the short articles we had Squadron One Eighteen, Squadron Forty Two, which we will read. Energy Shield, Scanner, Medical Emergency Locator, Intersplace Communication Technology, Sentient Trading, Muse Simpod, Cryopod, Retribution, I kind of want to read that too, <laughs> Volt System, the Krail System, Doppel, the Etom, 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 Freeze, Mala, Maze, Neon, Glow, and Thrust. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the full length article, Corn. where they're going to read Squadron 42, and that's important for this year and the game releasing next year. And then I just want to read Retribution, um, and there's a reason for that. So let's now let's arrange. So let's do Corn first. We'll end with Squadron 42, and then we'll do Retribution. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. Okay, here we go. Corin. Killian 9. Ah, right, here we go. <clears throat> Corin Killian 9 is a mesoplanet in the Killian system, UEE, owned by the UEE Marines, located far outside the system. Let me share my screen. <laughs> located far outside the system's green band, surface conditions on the planet are very dangerous for anyone without protective gear. The Marines maintain an extensive underground base here, used as their headquarters and primary training ground. The exact nature of their training is classified, but many believe that the planet's inhospitable environment factors heavily into it. A full Marine battle group patrols the area around Corrin at all times to prevent unauthorized access. History Corn was discovered in standard Earth year 2463 in the initial survey of the Killian system. As human territory expanded from Killian to Ellis, from Ellis to Magnus, then from Magnus to Terra, Killian's connection to these systems caused its strategic value to rise. Multiple branches of the military were among the first colonizers of Killian, starting with a forward operating base from the UEE Navy on MacArthur, Killian 5. In 2560, the newly independent UEE Marines chose Corrin, an inhospitable frozen dwarf planet, to use as a base for extreme condition training operations. Corrin's position beyond Killian's frost line made it impossible to terraform. The Marines instead established a sealed colony as their initial base and soon expanded underground with factories, water processing plants, and waste recycling facilities staffed and run by Marines and high-level clearance contractors. Additionally, budget reports from 2611 or 2611 <laughs> revealed that archaeologies for raising livestock and growing produce were added to Corrin's surface. In 2633, construction appeared to be complete and all imports to the planet ceased. The UEE Marine Headquarters Today, Corrin remains entirely within the purview of the Marines. The planet is surrounded by a no-fly zone and is patrolled at all times. Ships have not been cleared to pass through Corrin space are subject to shoot to kill orders. Non-military ships that have been cleared to land by high command are only allowed to land on Corrin's surface with the stipulation that they do not enter the underground base. Because the base is self-sufficient, this happens very rarely. 
All Marines selected for service from the Army or Navy go through six months of rigorous training on Corin. While the majority of a recruit's training takes place underground, war games and other training exercises are conducted on Corin's harsh surface to prepare each recruit for the rigors of fighting in potentially deadly environments. All right, Retribution. <clears throat> this is, uh, yeah, I think the Bengal carrier. This is the Vandal version. So I love it. Um, I think I got that completely wrong. The Retribution is, okay, yes, because the kingship. Let me just read the article. This is actually UEE. The kingship has has one as well. What what is the what is the Vandal version? Retribution, let's go. <laughs> Retribution is a dreadnought spacecraft manufactured by the UEE military in cooperation with the multiple major manufacturers designed to counter Vandal kingships. Is the Vandal kingship the name of the large ship? It is. Yes. Okay, that's what it is. The Vandal Kingship, as you're seeing on my screen, is the massive Bengal carrier version of the Vandal. Okay, my bad. <laughs> Back to the article. Designed to counter Vandal Kingships, the Retribution is the largest type of capital ship used by the UEE military at around 2,700 meters in length. It was codenamed Project, Project Weedin, Oedin? During its development period, initially started in 2931, the project proved too costly and was put on hold multiple times in order to acquire more funding. The project was resurrected in the wake of the Battle of Vega II and in standard Earth year 2946. The first completed retribution was assigned to the 65th Battle Group under the command of Admiral Ernst Bishop. All right, so I butchered the beginning of that, <laughs> but because I get like the the Bengal carrier is not the largest ship in the UEE fleet. It's actually the Retribution. Okay, so I get those kind of mixed up from time to time, and then the Vandal Kingship, which we know very little about. Um, I I would love that is one alien ship I would absolutely buy, yeah, a capital sized alien ship, absolutely. All right, let's end with Squadron 42. And again, this is like the first, if you go to search and you search Squadron 42, nothing used to come up. Now something does. One article, and it is this one. Here we go. The 42nd Special Fighter Squadron, Squadron 42, is an active unit of the UEE Navy Currently assigned to the 2nd Fleet 65th Battle Group, Squadron 42 is most often deployed for missions that require a high level of skill. Originally established as a disciplinary unit for soldiers who failed to follow orders, it came to fame in Standard Earth Year 2610 during the Battle of Centauri at the end of the Second Tavaran War. Their newly assigned commander, Captain Alex Alexandra Dunlevy, noted the individual talents of the pilots during missions and began to give them leeway to make their own calls. This strategy led to a series of successes that eventually put the 42nd in the path of Warlord Corthal. Under their own direction, the 42nd ambushed the fleet as it was funneling through a jump point to the Elysium system and disabled their shields, thus opening the way for the UEE's Navy carrier ships to move in and decimate the Tavaran Armada. This brought an end to the Long War and marked the beginning of the 42nd's history of prestige. We gotta get back to lore. It's been a while since we've done a lore deep dive. I'm digging the lore. The problem I currently have with the lore is like, it's not official. I mean, things have changed over the last several years. And so there's a part of me that's like, you know, how much stock do we put in some of these? That's why at the beginning of the Beyond the Verse podcast, I started with like the time capsules, like the, the pillars of the lore that probably won't change. I started with that and then I kind of let that part of this podcast go because the rest of this is easily changed before it becomes star citizen 1.0 but i'm very happy to see that the squadron 42 article 
finally came out. And I'm looking forward to future articles as we get closer to the launch of Squadron 42. I'm assuming I can I can make a pretty good assumption that we'll be seeing a lot more of these types of articles. So with that, we'll wrap up episode 64 of Beyond the Verse Star Citizen podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. If you want to become part of the conversation, you can do so by emailing us at contact at beyondtheversehq.com. All of our socials are forward slash BTV underscore cast. Uh, at the end of each episode on Spotify, we ask a poll and a Q&A, which we will, like we did at this episode, we will go through all of your answers and respond to ma- the majority of them. Um, watch our video replays over on YouTube at forward slash at BTV underscore cast. Join our in-game organization, Soul Provision, at www.robertspaceindustries.com forward slash orgs forward slash provision. I hope this finds each of you well, and until next Friday morning, safe travels as you traverse beyond the verse. Take care, everybody.